You know, a lot of the talk on this channel is talking about things like... I just ate a peanut butter cup. I'm sorry. It was really good. You know, a lot of the talk on this channel is about far-flung retro systems. Things like the NES, the Famicom, the Sega Genesis, the Saturn. And while I love all of those consoles, I think they're all fantastic, I think it's also really easy to lose the forest for the trees and not pay attention to consoles that have just kind of recently gone out of cycle. And that is why today I am returning to the $100 challenge and I am building you a collection for the Xbox 360 for under $100. And before we get into it, I want to point out right away, you're not going to see any Call of Duty. You're not going to see any Gears of War. This is my list. This is the $100 I would spend. But if there's games that are not on this list that you think should be, let me know in the comments down below. And we are kicking things off with the most expensive game on the list, one of my all-time favorite RPGs, Dragon Age Origins Ultimate Edition. I've told the story briefly in the past on some other videos about how Dragon Age Origins Ultimate Edition was the last game I purchased from our company store when I worked at EA. And it holds a pretty special place in my heart because of that. But there's also the fact that it's just a really damn good game. This is a Western RPG developed by Bioware. It's a fantasy setting, which I really enjoy. And you play a character that is known as a Grey Warden. And what a Grey Warden is, is a person who hunts demons and fights the Darkspawn. And you're able to basically craft your character from a different series of races and abilities and fight all these different variety of enemies, and that's great. But what the best part of it is, is all of the different characters that you're able to meet throughout and have join your party. Whether it's meeting Alistair, who is also a fellow Grey Warden, or Morrigan, who is a sorceress, it's a game that puts you deep into the setting and just has a fantastic combat system, a wonderful skill tree development, and just has a massive list of characters that you're able to recruit. One of the things I really like about the Ultimate Edition is that it offers all of the DLC that was in the game, as well as offering new characters to play. This one has a ton of gameplay in it, which I really enjoy, so it's never going to be the same game twice. You're actually able to change it up quite a bit depending on what your starting character is, what characters you want to have romance with, and anything you want to do in the game as far as pursuing side quests and different plot points. This is a wonderful title. So yeah, as of March 16th, 2023, Dragon Age Origins is the most expensive game on this list at $19.85. And I honestly think that's a bit of a steal. You've got over 100 hours of gameplay on here just for a single quest, and there's all kinds of different options you can go back. This is one of my favorite things. Like, this combines the brilliance of a fantasy hack-and-slash RPG with Bioware. It's kind of everything I wanted. As much as I love Knights of the Old Republic, I love Jade Empire, I wanted something set in for lack of a better term, fantasy times, where I was going to be able to step into the role of a character and enjoy it, and this game nails it. Next, we are going to World War II. This is the Saboteur. Set in Paris during World War II at the height of the Nazi occupation, the Saboteur is a fantastic third-person action-adventure game where you play as an Irish freedom fighter named Sean. The game is a magnificent experience just because of how kind of advanced it is so it's not just a game where it's a typical third person action adventure game no you you actually get to influence the city based on your actions so when you liberate certain parts of the city you'll see it go from a stark black and white environment with just the red appearing on the nazi flags and on their armbands to actually having full color as the people of paris believe in the resistance you're able to equip perks as you develop throughout the game as you learn as you complete your combat missions and the game just kind of builds itself around you and molds itself to the way you play. I really enjoy The Saboteur. It's a game that has a signature style to it, and I've never seen a game do it quite like this one. There's a lot of excellent third-person games on the Xbox 360, and The Saboteur is right up there. I remember when The Saboteur launched, I was fascinated by the concept because I think World War II is ripe for video games. It's something that the original Medal of Honor games, the original Battlefield 1942, were games that I absolutely adored and I thought was a fantastic setting to put yourself in the role of the hero. And the saboteur does that, it's just you're a little bit on the dirtier side than what you would have seen in a Medal of Honor or anything like that. Uh, the characterization is fantastic, although the Irish accent is horrific. The game is wonderful. It is a hard M, so if you are not a fan of gore if you're not a fan of language then i wouldn't suggest picking it up but the saboteur is one of my favorite games i love the mechanic of bringing light and color back to the world the further you play it's it's a magnificent title absolutely love it next we're going with one of my favorite rockstar games from this generation this is red dead redemption game of the year 
I remember when Red Dead Redemption released because it was something that I was really excited for. I'm a fan of Rockstar's games, but I don't enjoy the Grand Theft Auto series. There's just, I don't know, it's, I just have a disconnect from it. So I was hoping to get something that was similar to GTA, but was set in a way that I would actually be able to enjoy it. And Red Dead Redemption hit every single note. This is the Game of the Year edition, and the Game of the Year edition includes every bit of DLC that was available for it, as well as the Undead Nightmare standalone game, a fantastic single-player campaign where Marston searches for a cure for a zombie plague. This game is signature Rockstar gameplay with a wonderful presentation style, fantastic voice acting, magnificent combat, and just a massive open world with a sprawling environment that just feels real, it feels lived in, it feels natural. It's such a great title. If you haven't played this one, it is absolutely worth checking out, as well as the sequel on the PS4, because it's just such a brilliant experience. The Game of the Year edition of Red Dead Redemption from Rockstar is my probably favorite game that they had done since Vice City. I love everything about this title. It is one of the prettiest looking games on the Xbox 360 with a fantastic storyline and a huge open world that can at times be a little bit boring, but it does so much so well. And there's awesome pack-ins as well with the Game of the Year edition, like, like the Zombies gameplay and stuff like that. It is a fantastic thing to pick up. It's a wonderful title, and it just shows what the 360 was capable of. Next, we are not going with a mature rated title. This is decidedly an E-rated game. And I love the LEGO games. I love every LEGO game that I have played, but one of my favorites that really leans into the property and shows off what it's capable of was LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean. I want to get this out of the way right now. You can't go wrong with any of the LEGO games on the Xbox 360. Every single one of them is great. I'm just going to give a little bit of love now to Pirates of the Caribbean because this is what I don't hear a lot of folks talk about. It was either going to be this or LEGO Indiana Jones, and I'm going with Pirates just because I feel like it, to be honest with you. This takes place during the first three Pirates of the Caribbean films. You get to play out the events of each one in a signature LEGO style, and it's just brilliantly done. There are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of characters to unlock, each one with their own abilities. The environments are massive, with tons of destructible aspects to them. It's signature LEGO gameplay style, just set in Jack Sparrow's universe. If you love the Pirates of the Caribbean films, this one's for you. If you don't love the Pirates of the Caribbean films, guess what? There's an answer elsewhere. If you like Lord of the Rings, that's there. Marvel superheroes, DC Comics, Lego Jurassic World. The answers are pretty much limitless on the 360. Lego games are awesome. This is the one I'm picking, but you can't go wrong with any of them. So we're out of the teens now and we are into the games under $10. Lego Pirates of the Caribbean is a wonderful title, but honestly, you can't go wrong with any of them, whether it's Jurassic World, or The Hobbit, or Lord of the Rings, or Marvel Super Heroes, or any of the LEGO Batman games, or yes, even LEGO Star Wars. As old as it is, and as bare bones as it is in comparison to other games in the LEGO series, still fantastic. For me, it was a toss-up between Pirates of the Caribbean and LEGO Indiana Jones. I wanted to go with Pirates just because I love all the different characters that you're able to play in it, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful game. Next up, we are going with Rare. This is Viva Pinata. Viva Pinata is an interesting game because it's either about 10 years too early or 10 years too late because it's going to fill the niche of anyone that really wants to play something like Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing, something along those lines. But it's got a signature rare style that I think a lot of people overlook. So first off, one of my favorite things about this is the graphics in the game. It has such a beautiful look to it and such a neat kind of rare take on what wild animals would be if they were made out of confetti and crepe paper, I suppose. You have a gardening simulation that's going on here where you need to be planting different items, digging up parts of your garden to put down grass and soil and things like that to attract different animals to your garden, and then you're working on breeding the animals together to get more animals in your garden. All the while, you've got this crazy kind of environment going on with a signature rare sense of humor that I don't think enough people appreciate. Viva Pinata is a great title. If you are into games like Stardew Valley, like Animal Crossing, or like Harvest Moon, you need this one on your list. I remember when Viva Pinata got announced, I was really excited about the look of the game and the style behind it because, I mean, I'm, I'm a rare fan, so 
I knew this is going to be something I wanted to play, but I didn't know if it was going to really have the gameplay I was looking for. Some of the stuff that they released on the original Xbox, while it was beautiful, just didn't hook me, but Viva Pinata did. It's one of those ones where I'm just kind of sad that it's disappeared and gone by the wayside. I, I wish it would come back and they would do more with it, but... Beggars and choosers, I suppose. Next, I'm going with uh, the first of two games in a row that I actually worked on. This is Mirror's Edge. I wanted to make sure I had a first-person game on this list because there were so many great first-person shooters on the 360, but I don't really like first-person shooters, so you're getting Mirror's Edge, a first-person runner. Now, I will admit that I am a little bit biased about this game because I did work on it, but I really love what DICE did with this game. First off, the visual style of the game is one of the best on the Xbox 360. It has such a great look between the stark whites and the reds that make it just pop and stand out. The inclusion of the crosshair in the middle of the screen to help with the motion sickness that a lot of people experienced was a stroke of genius. The storyline is really fun. The gameplay is challenging, but it's forgiving. So it's not something where you're going to just get frustrated and want to stop. You understand the jumps you have to make and the paths you need to take. It's just a matter of making sure you have the rhythm and your timing down. This is such an excellent game, and it's one of those games that I just look at and think that more people need to play. Not that a lot of people didn't play it, but I don't know that a lot of people really appreciated it for what it did. While there is a bias here, because I did work on it, I do think Mirror's Edge is a remarkable title in the fact that it really showed kind of a different way to play a game. This was a first-person game, but it wasn't a first-person shooter, it was a first-person runner. You were moving throughout the city and jumping and dodging and rolling and making sure that you were able to stay clear of being killed by the people with the guns. It was kind of the opposite of what I'm used to with first-person shooters. It's a really remarkable title and it was something I was I was truly honored and just so fortunate to work on. It's a magnificent game. If you haven't played it, you really should. I was wrong. It's not two games I've worked on in a row. Uh, but this is a signature title from Microsoft. This is Fable 2. There's something kind of magical about the Fable universe, and I haven't played a Fable game I dislike. There's definitely ones I like more than others, of course, but I really like Fable 2. It does a lot better than the original, and it plays pretty well. Like, I want to stress, like, the Fable games never quite live up to the expectation. I mean, it's a Peter Molyneux game. What a surprise, right? But there's something to be said about what it was able to do. The landing it was able to stick, even if there was a little bit of a stumble, it's still a really fun game. You play as Sparrow, and you start off as a child, and as you're growing up in Albion, you develop your character, and you're able to make moralistic choices that are going to impact how people perceive you, the different things you're able to do, and the appearance of your character in-game. When you die, you get a scar, and those scars don't go away, and the more scarred you are, the less people are going to react positively to you. And if you start breaking the law, people are going to react more negatively to you. But if you're more virtuistic and you're on the right side of the law, people will act more favorably to you. It's a really charming game. Is it perfect? No. By no stretch of the imagination is a perfect title. But the ambition it had and the things it was able to do based on the fact that what was promised, we didn't quite get to. But what we got was still pretty remarkable. Fable 2 is a fantastic title. It's a really fun action RPG, and it offers something that no other game does. I'm a sucker for the Fable series, I admit it. I might be more of a sucker because of the promise of what Fable could be as opposed to what Fable is, but I still think there's a good core here, and there's something to be said for what they were able to deliver. The good and the bad scale, the moralistic choices you're able to make, and the appearance of your character shifting based on what you did in the game is pretty remarkable in the grand scheme of things, and it's executed incredibly well, dare I say it, better than in some Bioware games fantastic game and one I truly love. Next up, we're going to a game I worked on and it is probably my favorite sports title on the 360. This is Fight Night Round 3. I freely admit to my bias on this game, but I am telling you beyond the shadow of a doubt, Fight Night Round 3 is one of the best sports titles on the Xbox 360. I wanted to make sure I offered a sports game on this list because a lot of people like them, myself included. And Fight Night Round 3 is one of the best. Featuring one of the best combat systems ever created for a video game, Fight Night has a ton of different boxers in it at all variety of weight classes, in amazing environments with a strong graphical game as well, and it just plays so fantastically well. 
There's even mini games in between rounds where you're able to reduce the swelling or seal up the cut on, a, on your boxer's face, as well as being able to kind of manage your stamina to be able to last longer in the fight. It's a beautiful game, it's a fantastic title, and it really exhibits exactly what boxing could be on a modern game. I'm really sad that the Fight Night property is dead and gone. The last game we got was Fight Night Champion, and it's a shame because round three was a promise of what could be, and it's just such a fantastic game. Yeah, as much as I love a lot of different sports games on the 360, all of the NHL games I'm a fan of, Fight Night Round 3 is the bread and butter. It is the cream of the crop. It is the absolute best sports game for me on the 360. I love the fight mechanic we put in. I love the style of the game. I love the soundtrack. It's just a remarkable title and an absolute blast to play to this day. I, I can't look over this one. I can't move past it without saying, yeah, if you have a 360, if you are a sport game fan, Fight Night should be on your list. Next, we're going with one of the best RPGs on the console. This is Tales of Vesperia. All right, let's talk Tales of Vesperia. Now, you'll notice I didn't throw to any footage of what the box art looks like here because I can't find my copy. I don't know where it is, but luckily I had footage captured from a few months ago. Now, why is Tales of Vesperia on this list? Mainly because it's probably the best JRPG on the Xbox 360 one of the few that was offered because it's such a signature Western console there that doesn't really have a huge Japanese foothold. And the Tales series is one of my favorites, whether it was Tales of Symphonia on the GameCube all the way up to today on modern consoles with Tales of Arise. This is just such a magnificent franchise with such a deep storyline and great gameplay. Now Vesperia has a fantastic look and style all of its own, but there's something to be said about what it's able to provide. There's a huge cast of characters, a fantastic combat system, and just a massive world to explore. And it just shouldn't be overlooked that this is where it started on the 360. I am a sucker for the Tales series. It is one of my favorite all-time JRPG series. And it's had a really interesting life cycle. Like, it's been on so many different consoles, and it's been siphoned off and siloed off in different consoles for a long time that sometimes you can miss them. And Tales of Vesperia was one that... When it released on the 360, I was shocked because I didn't expect to see it there, but I was happy to see it because it's such a great game and it looks so good on the 360. I'm a huge fan of the Tales series. Vesperia is one of my favorites and just so happy to have this one. And it's dirt cheap. It's like a $6 game and you can't beat that. Complete in box too. Like it is just like bare bones cheap. And finally, we are going with what is probably the best game in the series from one of my favorite series of games. Assassin's Creed 2. Assassin's Creed 2 is the realization of the promise that was Assassin's Creed 1. The first Assassin's Creed game, as much as I love it, was kind of a dud. Altair was a fantastic character, but the world he lived in was kind of stilted and boxy, and as Stuart says from Generation Pixel, it was a tech demo. Now, Assassin's Creed 2 improves everything. Ezio is a better character. The world is more real and alive. The gameplay is stronger, the traversal is better, everything is just plussed in Assassin's Creed 2. It is exactly the type of sequel that should happen when you're building a franchise. You play as Ezio. Ezio is an incredible character with a deep array of emotions and just personality traits that make him more real and more entertaining than Altair ever was. It's a brilliant game with a massive world to explore and it leads to a fantastic trilogy of games between Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and Revelation. This is such a dirt cheap game, and all of the Assassin's Creed games on the 360 are at this point, but it's definitely it's worth playing life. because this, this is where the franchise really started. As much as I love the first Assassin's Creed, it was, as my friend Stuart from Generation Pixel says, a tech demo. It was a demonstration of what the engine was capable of as opposed to a fully realized game. But with Assassin's Creed 2, stepping into the role of Ezio was something where you felt the world open up and come alive, and there was so much more to do and so much more to interact with. And yes, you still had all the terrible games where you had to go and find all the feathers and stuff like that, but the core game itself really showed the potential of Assassin's Creed, and this is what made me fall in love again with the series and realize that as much as I love the first one, the second one was superior in every conceivable way. There you have it, my friends. Coming out at just under $100, there is my Xbox 360 collection that I would build 
for under 100. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like down below. If you really liked it, leave a comment as well. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear your thoughts on this video. If you want to see more in this series, check out the playlist that's on screen right now. And remember to play more games, stay square, and take care. I'll talk to you soon.